what you hear be in the name of God. Amen. And may you hear me. Uh, Romans chapter 8 is the pinnacle of Paul's teaching on the life that the Spirit gives us, the life that we have because of the crucified and resurrected Jesus. And it fits with the lessons of both from the, the raising of dry bones and, and the raising of Lazarus one being a, a, a prophecy for the future of, of Israel and God's kingdom, and the other, of course, being a literal raising to, to life of a human being. And in, in there is this promise that you and I also are going to share in this new life, but it's, as I've said, ongoing in the last few sermons, that this life is not just out there somewhere in the future, it's, it's also here. And in what sense is that life here? How can we talk about the life that the Holy Spirit uh, makes it possible for us to live? And I think the first thing that Paul wants to tell us, and, and remember, you may not remember, but Romans chapter 8 begins with this, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it ends with, what could separate us from the love of God? And he goes through this list, can, can death, can life, can angels, can things in heaven and things on earth, can anything separate us from the love of God? And the answer, of course, to all of that is no. And what Paul is trying to tell us is that the life that we have in the Spirit is, among other things, a life of full absolution and authority over sin. In Romans 8, 3, he wrote, So he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. We do not live according to the, those who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The whole according to the flesh, according to the Spirit, Paul is weaving in this chapter images of baptism that we are, we are participating in the death of Jesus Christ and somehow we're participating in the power uh, that's present in that death. And here's one way to think about it. When, when we ask as Christians, why did Jesus have to die? The answers to that question fall under the umbrella, theological umbrella of atonement. And that Jesus atoned for our sins. But there are different ways of thinking about that. One that you might be more familiar with is called substitutionary atonement. Where uh, Jesus took on himself the, uh, our sin and Jesus took on himself the punishment that was rightly ours because of our sin. And that's, that's true. That's a, that's a good way of looking at it. There's another though, another way of looking at it. And it's called Christus Victor, or the victory of, of Christ. And this looks at the atonement from the perspective of not so much atoning for sin and, and making this holy God at ease with, with the sin that we've had or appeasing him in some way, but rather that sin itself is utterly and completely defeated. As we look to Palm Sunday and Holy Week, think about, as we read again the passion of Jesus, how evil in all its forms are thrown at Jesus. Personal evil, social evil, political evil, religious evil, spiritual evil, all of it is unleashed on Jesus. And he takes it all of its forms, it does its worst on him. Jesus bore it all, the entire weight of sin, in his body, in his flesh. Remember, in John's version of the Passion during the, the trial of Jesus, there are the, the leaders of Israel and the Jewish people, they're all clamoring for Jesus to be crucified, and at one point, Pilate 
calls out to them and says, shall I crucify your king? Now keep in mind, these are the people, the Jews, who have been longing and been praying and hoping that God would send a king, a Messiah, who would win the great battle over the pagan oppressors, Rome, oust them, bring Israel back to its glory, and usher in the kingdom of God, rebuild the temple, restore everything. And here are these people who have been longing for this, and when Pilate calls out, shall I crucify your king, these are the people who say, we have no king but Caesar. All of this evil thrown at Jesus, and it kills him. But then three days later, he rises from the dead. Those who live by the Spirit have absolution and authority over sin because sin had its back broken. It threw everything it had at Jesus and its power was taken away. It was rendered impotent in the victory of Jesus on the cross. And so we can then now live this life of full absolution and authority and also a life of joyful anticipation. I said last week that when we think about anticipate, we, we need to think about not just sort of waiting for things to happen, but that we are preparing ourselves and, and changing the way we live in light of this new reality that we have. And this future life that we have, that we anticipate in the present, it's not that we don't sin anymore. It's not that, uh, nor is it that we live as if sin doesn't matter, but rather, as Paul put it in 2 Corinthians, we never give up. We never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Even in our struggles, we have hope. Even when the situation is hopeless, we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, and that gives hope. And that's because Jesus' death has destroyed sin. In baptism, Paul wrote in Romans 7, we participate in Christ's death. That is, we participate in the power that defeats sin and death. If we have been united with him in his death, he wrote, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection life like his. This joyful anticipation urges us onward not to give up, not to lose heart when we fail, when we fall short. And I think that's ultimately one of the points that Paul wants to make in this chapter. We have this life of constant confident assurance. Christians, in, in, my, in my life as a priest, I can't begin to tell you the number of people, some of, some of them are right here in this room, who live in anguish and fear over sin and the possibility that sin could somehow separate them from Jesus and from God. Uh, I can remember growing up uh, in the Episcopal Church, uh, I can remember a teacher of our youth group uh, telling us that we need to be careful because if we were to get in an auto accident and die before we had been able to confess, we might go to hell. I can't tell you the number of, of parents who worry and wring their hands over whether or not a, a child that's not baptized would go to hell and so the, the motive for coming to bring a child for baptism isn't to live a joyful, obedient life to Jesus, but out of fear of what God might do to an unbaptized person. And that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And... 
It hit me yesterday, and I'm not a musician, so this perhaps is not a good analogy, but I think that the salvation, the life that we're given in the Spirit is rather like playing a musical instrument. That you play it because you love it. You play it because you want to make music. And when you play wrong notes, the response to that isn't to take the instrument away from you, but the response is to point out the wrong note so that you can start playing the right notes. That's the whole point of there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's not that it doesn't matter what notes you play. Of course it does. And I suppose if you started just playing your own tune, God would let you do that. Even if you decided to do that for eternity, I suppose he'll let you do that. But for those who are seeking to follow him and live the life of the Spirit of God, there's no fear about hitting the wrong note. It, the Spirit draws your attention to it so that you can start playing the right ones. This is the strangeness of Easter life. You know, here's Lazarus raised from the dead. We don't know anything about him other than he's Martha's brother. But I can tell you one thing, he didn't deserve to have life given to him again. It was given to him as a gift. And the new life of the Spirit is given to you. The new life where there is fullness of absolution and authority over sin. Where there is joyful anticipation of the life that we have. And where there's confident assurance that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen.